Now, I, I thought what I would do uh, this evening, and I hope this is okay with you, is that I'd like to um, share with you uh, some, some of, some, something of a, a recent body of work I made in Brighton called Assembly. Um, and then I'll, I'll sort of shift gear slightly and, and read some more sort of um, structured thoughts uh, that uh, respond to, I suppose, the kinds of questions that uh, uh, I'm sort of invested in, in a practice which is often described as participatory, uh, socially engaged or otherwise uh, in, involving uh, methodologies of collaboration. And then following that, I'll then just talk about a few other sort of bodies of work. Um, and, then, and then certainly um, it'd be great to have a conversation with you. Um, so uh, now as part of assembly, I, I worked with a homeless support service called the First Base Day Center and uh, another one called the Phase One Project. Um, I worked in the kitchen for about three months, uh, cooking and serving breakfasts and lunch. Um, and then I invited individuals to use single-use cameras to create photographs and digital sound recorders, uh, to use digital sound recorders to capture their experiences. Um, I met with the participants regularly and uh, to discuss their images and sounds and to record conversations uh, about the power and problems of representation uh, to varying degrees. Um, participants were also invited to learn how to use uh, medium format, digital medium format camera equipment uh, over repeated sessions tethered to a laptop in situ um, to create a, a self-portrait for, for an ongoing series that I've been working on uh, since 2002 called Assisted Self-Portraits. Um, additionally, Assembly, um, as you will hear, uh, features uh, an exchange with uh, a community choir called the Cascade Chorus uh, that I collaborated with uh, and we met regularly uh, to sing, uh, record sounds and to do public performances. Um, and, and additionally, uh, Assembly also features, and I'll show you this, you'll see, uh, a research-based piece of work that I, I created with one particular participant called Gerald McClavity, where uh, we constructed a, a text that was written uh, from his point of view with a series of, of direct questions that was then sent out to uh, the rep housing and homelessness services representatives and, and councils of cities and towns, uh, 40 cities and towns across the UK. And we compiled that research uh, for people to see in the gallery space. What is collaboration in research and artistic practice for? Who is it for? How might it serve the various individuals and agencies involved? the participants taking part, the facilitating artists or researchers, the, the organizations that commissioned or funded the work. Where do the boundaries lie between a collaborative practice or an artist using or seducing a group of people for the production of their artwork? In her 1983 publication, Committing Photography, Sue Braden offers what I think is one of the most useful, if perhaps only, comprehensive survey of the early community photography practices here in the UK by tracing their roots through the history of community organizing and group action to affect social and political change. Braden notes the very term community is a confusing, fluctuating and ambiguous term. And she charts a use of the medium by self-initiated collectives, individuals and grassroots organizations who wanted to find a way to provide groups of people to communicate something about themselves and their concerns in opposition to the dominant representations which were stereotyped, mass-produced, commercially led and fed to the public by a small elite. In some ways, over 30 years since it was published, Braden's text may be seen as outdated. Most collaborative practice we encounter now is through the industry of state-funded learning and engagement programs and is rarely autonomously conceived, executed and presented in the context of dialectical opposition to the mainstream. Yet the thrust of Braden's argument around the criticality of communi community photographic practices and self-representation are absolutely relevant today. Benefits, outcomes, targets, aims, ambitions, evaluations. It's in the elaboration of terms such as these that answers to the kinds of questions I have just asked are often purportedly found. Elaborations that, in, that tell of empowering individuals, improving self-confidence, bettering self-esteem, giving voice, or enabling development, all through the transformative power of art, to use the rhetorical catchphrase of the New Labour incarnation of Arts Council England. And so, at this point, I'd like to insert a quote by the writer J.G. Ballard from his autobiography, Miracles of Life. He says, the patronage of the arts by the state serves a political role 
by performing a castration ceremony, neutering any revolutionary impulse and reducing the arts community to a docile herd. They are allowed to bleat, but are too enfeebled to ever pour the ground. While I and other artists who work with similar production methodologies will have very particular and varied intentions for undertaking this kind of work, I think that too often the well-intentioned ambitions of the artist or organisation might assume too much or too little of the individuals participating and not take into full consideration the holistic circumstances of the participant or subject before, during and after engagement with the artist. An incisive question on community art practice once asked by the American critic Patricia C. Phillips resounds, does it succeed because good intentions are irreproachable? But who is being empowered? Whose voice is amplified? Who is being made visible? What can the participating individual or community group gain by taking part? How does the artist profit? How can the outcomes or products of the collaboration be measured described or otherwise effectively relayed to those not involved in the processes of making the work. The products or outcomes are created or that are created or mediated by the artist as representative of the process or practice of working with uh, a community group circulate in their own right and as such constitute a representation of the subjects, participants, as well as the process of their engagement with the artist or institution and therefore must be answerable to a certain kind of questioning. What is the intention of the artist? What does the artist put forward as representation of process? How has the artist or organisation framed the photographs and or other material made by the participants for their presentation? I do believe that photography and photographs can have very powerful impacts on people, and I know that they have on me, However, I do not undertake the work that I do in order to enrich or provide a therapeutic framework for those taking part, even though some of the organisations I've worked with have framed my practice in such a way that intimates this for the satisfaction of their own particular agendas. It might be said that a community photography practice can have social benefits, but my primary interest in working in the way that I do is more to do with exploring the possibility of presenting the viewpoints of the people I work with alongside my own. And so when considering practices that use photographs made by other people, it's not enough to only consider what is in the image. It must also be asked, what does the artist do with the photograph? And as an artist who works with other people's images, I am aware that the practice of generating and handling other people's photographs is always a multifaceted process of dialogue, exchange, compromise and trust, and the many other nuanced complexities that cast personal relationships. Any outline of a collaborative, participatory or socially, socially engaged or co-produced practice, particularly by an outside observer, will unavoidably be reductive to some degree. Yet, when a practice incorporating other people's photographs is disseminated publicly outside the context of the group of people who created the material, it must be viewed foremost as a practice of representation which is framed, contained, or relayed in some way, and not simply as the display of an unmediated reality. And with projects that facilitate the production of images by children or other spoken for or disempowered individuals, consideration of issues around intention, context, and representation become particularly heightened. I know from my own experience that the, the good intentions of a facilitating artist or, or an organization and the potential positive impact of processing, sorry, of the process of undertaking this kind of practice can smokescreen any real critical rigour applied to the creation and consideration of the work. Good intentions will often inadvertently mask the essentially insurmountable and unequal power balance between the artist and their subject or participant. While photographs and many different kinds of photographic practices can have powerful impacts on people, the whole idea of benefits, values or outcomes inferred onto the subjects would really best be answered by the subjects or participants themselves. And I don't mean through the forum of an evaluation exercise, which seems to me, and often by design, to most serve, mostly serve an instrumental purpose to affirm the agenda of the facilitating individuals or organisations paying for the activity. A large part of the difficulty of collaboration in photographic practice concerned with social representation is in the potential pitfall of paternalism. For regardless of how much more involved the subject is allowed to take part in the construction of their own representation, 
authorship can only be filtered through the singular voice of the artist or organisation. The unequal power relations located inside and out of any photographic arrangement between the photographer and subject are essentially insurmountable. Collaborative practice, in its most worthy and misguided sense, chases fulfilment of an unachievable ideal, that is, to put power in the hands of the powerless. However, I strongly believe that strategies of collaboration or facilitation can be key in attempting to understand the subject of study depicted, issues around representation, and fundamentally, the medium of photography itself. So I just want to shift gear a little and um, just talk to you about some, <coughs> some previous work. And, and I first came to work with homeless people in London in 2002. I was invited by someone who worked for a homeless charity organisation to come and photograph at uh, an event called Crisis Open Christmas. And she said to me, it's an amazing place. There's over a thousand homeless people in this great big disused warehouse and it looks like an Hieronymus Bosch painting. Come and take pictures, it'll be great. And I was like, ugh. I don't know about that. That's a bit weird. I think I'd prefer to see what the people I met would photograph. And, uh, and I left it at that. And a few months later, I was doing some consultation work for Kodak on the single-use camera marketing campaign. And this conversation was bouncing around my head. And I thought, wow, I'm actually in the position here to make this thing happen. So I got about 20 grand's worth of disposable cameras and processing vouchers and pitched up at the next Crisis Open Christmas and volunteered and did all the kind of stuff that a volunteer does in those situations. I organised a karaoke session, I worked in the kitchen, I worked on a, a desk which delivered blankets and clothing and just talked to people. And when it seemed appropriate, I invited people to come and meet with me on a Friday afternoon at this place in Spitalfields where I would be setting up between two and five and welcoming people to come in and take cameras away, to take them away and photograph anything they wanted. And should they be interested, to let me use those pictures. So there's a few pictures of, of those sort of early sessions there. And uh, people were photographing all kinds of things. These pictures here were made by a man called uh, Golden, who at the time um, was living here. And what he'd done is he'd uh, pushed up a whole bunch of rubbish against the side of a building and created a little home for himself inside. And so when you go uh, behind this white tarpaulin, you end up in, in here. And, and what I found was that I was, my kind of uh, preconceptions about the experience of homeless people was being pushed and challenged the whole time as the conversations grew. And, uh, you know, the, the sort of Christmas decorations, the art on the walls, the food stall, the, the TV, the VCR player and the armchair to sleep in were far removed from my sort of, at that time, thinking about what it was like for a homeless person. Gypsy was sleeping on the steps of the Royal Academy at the time in these cardboard boxes. And after about three months of just hundreds, literally hundreds of pictures of boxes, I was like, Gypsy, why do you take pictures of boxes all the time? And he was like, well, I wake up, I'm inside a box. I get out of my box. I've got to find somewhere for my box to go. And when it's not there, I've got to find myself a new box. And this is, this is Reuben. Reuben had a completely different story. Uh, Reuben arrived from Georgia, the former state of the USSR. And uh, he had uh, been through a very long period of trying to claim asylum in various European countries. Uh, where he was unsuccessful. He spent 35 nights living in a, or not living, traveling in a shipping container from, from, uh, from Spain through to New York, where he lived illegally on the streets for two years. And then he did the shipping container trip from New York to uh, Ireland. And from Ireland, he got himself on a ferry and came across to London around 2004. And Reuben got really excited about taking pictures of his experiences and the difference between what he thought London would be and what it actually was. These images here are made by, by Phil Robinson and his friend Sonia and her two children, Lily and Joe, who would take the camera away every week and photograph just their life, their daily experiences. But each person in the little family unit would use the camera uh, for their family album. And after uh, about two years, uh, one of the participants, Christian, came into uh, one of the sessions and said, I've met this woman called Victoria, and she works at the Whitechapel Gallery. Here's her business card. She said, give her a call. So I called this person, Victoria Jones is her name, and, and I met with her. And uh, she was really excited about this, this project. I, I'd worked with quite a few people, probably about 200 people at that point, and had this big collection of photographs. And, and she wanted to find a way to exhibit them uh, in association with the gallery. And I thought that was a really exciting opportunity, but something didn't kind of feel right. 
I hadn't shown this work professionally in the photography community at that point, and, and I was just really aware that the first time this work was shown, I wanted it to be in the right place so it could reach the right audience, and it didn't seem right to me that it would be done with the gallery. Could have been, I suppose, but I don't know. I, I just didn't like the idea of it. And so um, I said, thanks, but no thanks. And uh, a few months later, she called me back and said, I've moved jobs and I'm now working on the London Underground. Would you like to show the work on the Underground? And I was like, yes, that would be great, because it would reach a lot of people in a way that was really unexpected, and people who maybe don't go to galleries. It just sort of seemed to make sense to me. And uh, I said, but can you wait? Because I want to try and find a way to represent some of the participants, those that will be interested. And I don't quite know how to do that. I need a bit of time. So I got a sponsorship deal with Calumet, uh, Hasselblad, the Pro Center, and a bunch of other kind of uh, community, um, photography supply uh, companies um, to let me have access to equipment over the course of a year and a half. And so I would experiment with different types of equipment. And these are some of the workbooks, uh, sort of spreads from work, the workbooks I kept at the time. And, and I would take away various types of small format, medium format, and large format camera equipment, film, uh, digital, and try and find a way to use equipment with someone who has little or no knowledge of photography to involve them um, over repeated sessions uh, to create what I call an assisted self-portrait. And together we would edit the picture together to choose the final one that I would then be able to use. And uh, so here we have an assisted self-portrait of Phil Robinson, an assisted self-portrait of Ruben Tarossian, here is Gypsy. This is Charmian Edge. Christina Alvarado. Gary McLaughlin. Uh, Nolene O'Connor Riani. Uh, Pavel Grigo. And uh, after a time, it was in 2005 and 2006, we had an exhibition in 12 stations in zones one and two. Uh, and each participant had a set of posters that included an assisted self-portrait of them and a selection of photographs that they'd created. And around this time, there was a little bit of sort of, you know, attention in the media and stuff, and I began to receive uh, in inquiries about this collection. Um, from all kinds of strange places, I, I received inquiries from a, a Bible manufacturing company who wanted to see and perhaps use an image for a cover of a new edition of the New Testament they were doing. Uh, there was a very sort of, uh, a, a very kind of cool uh, homeware manufacturing company uh, in, in Melbourne, Australia that commissions contemporary artists, uh, people like David Shrigley and all kinds of interesting people to create limited edition tea towels and aprons and other household items and her suggestions that we kind of create these plates. <laughs> but what that, those kinds of requests which I turned down got me thinking about this idea of the collection as an archive and, and the role of myself as a guardian to, to a, a, and having a sort of sense of responsibility. And so I began to research community photography projects across the UK. And I became particularly interested in, in the work of Belfast Exposed and, and how Belfast Exposed uh, grew out of a, 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 a collective of, of, of photographers who felt sort of impassioned about the way in which Belfast, their hometown, was being represented and shown to the outside world and how they might kind of go against the grain of that through their own foot photographs, but also through working with community groups in different parts of the city. And, um, and in how those photographs and, and that material uh, had been collected over a very long period of time uh, and, and still exists. It's a very important, interesting uh, archive uh, of photographs at Belfast Exposed Photography. And of course, the organization has grown into a, a very sophisticated photography organization that's much more than a community photography project, but is very sort of deeply and firmly uh, placed within uh, the community. So it seemed like the right place for me to sort of focus on for a little bit. And I, I went along to a portfolio review event in Birmingham and I met a woman called Karen Downey, who was the exhibition curator um, who worked alongside Pauline at the time. And, uh, and I, I sort of talked about my, my sort of work and my interests and, and she invited me to come over and, and meet with, with herself and with Pauline a little while later. And, uh, and we together came up with this idea of, of a two-strand residency. On the one hand, I would create new work in Belfast and on the other, I would undertake a research project into the uh, ethical, practical, and theoretical issues uh, involved in handling a collection of photographs made by other people. And so I, I worked uh, at a place called the Welcome, um, the Welcome Community uh, in uh, West Belfast, just off the Falls Road. 
And, and I um, would, would go there and volunteer in the kitchen and meet people and invite people to take cameras away and photograph their experiences. And, and after a time, I began to invite people to create assisted self-portraits with me. And it was a really extraordinary experience. I had this really sort of very uh, kind of privileged position to be taken on essentially these guided walking tours by the individuals to various places that had personal meaning for them. Here we have Joe Wallace. And in doing so, I wanted to self-reflexively think about the way in which I was working in London. So to kind of really think about this idea of methodology and to really sort of think about how that process is the practice. And what we're left with, in a way, are the kind of remains, the ephemera. And how could I begin to think about sort of sewing up the two? Here we have Caroline McDonnell. I began to undertake interviews with people or, or converse, recording conversations. And, uh, and again, it was sort of about this idea of representation. Have you been photographed? What was it like to be photographed? What was it like to take part in working with me? I wasn't really interested in asking him about what happened to them but rather, what's it like to be the subject of study? This is Joe Murray. And Susan Norton. And so what you're seeing are a mixture of photographs made by participants, the assisted self-portraits, uh, documentation of us working together in photographs made by myself, here we have Brian Horrocks. And over the course of, gosh, 18 months or so, a, a huge number of photographs had been collected. I worked with over uh, probably about 60 people, uh, both at the Welcome Center and also with the Simon community as well. Here we have Tone Donnell, Donnelly and Angela Wildman. Maggie Irvine. And Sean McCauley. And yeah, so when it came to a point of, uh, you know, showing the work, exhibiting the work, many conversations were had individually with participants and also with the, with the group of participants that I could bring together around what that collection selection should be for the exhibition. And of course, it, Alongside that, there were, were many kinds of critical conversations that I was having with Karen Downey, with Pauline, and with other members of the Belfast Exposed uh, community. This is Chris McCabe. And in preparation for the exhibition, as I said, there were many kinds of conversation with <coughs> participants. And, and it was a really kind of interesting process for me because coming to the pictures and coming you know, coming to the pictures through the lens of the kind of critical conversations with a curator, um, thinking about the sort of history of representation of Northern Ireland, but also thinking about the group of people that I've been working with as well. There's all these kinds of issues around how, how do I then make sense of the process, the individuals, and, and a representation of Belfast. And we decided to, to really focus on the, the landscape of Belfast and to sort of situate the individuals within that. Um, I wanted to really draw attention to this idea of process through the exhibition and so using a kind of mid-grey colour, which is a type of colour for those of you that are involved in photography, has been used to kind of help calculate exposure. 
Um, so we painted the walls mid grey. We had the assisted self portraits printed at four foot, sorry, five foot wide by four foot high, uh, slightly bigger than life size. And we, we positioned them just above eye level. So you have this very palpable sense of being looked down upon by a powerful person. And to just masking tape the work to the walls, to kind of get away from that sort of commodification of documentary photographic images that we're used to seeing in gallery contexts. Really think about what this is process of representation. And uh, after a time, we, we published a book of the work. And I've got a couple of copies of that here, which you're more than welcome to, to take a look at um, now or later, if you like. I'll just um, pass them around. You guys can check them out. Um, and in a way, the, the book is a sort of culmination of the body of work. And uh, at the same time, I also wrote a, a paper which was published in a journal called Photographies, which in a way was the culmination of the um, the kind of uh, research that I was undertaken, undertaking into the organisation and the sort of self-reflexive thinking that I was undertaking in relation to my practice. So I thought I'd just uh, go in a slightly different direction and um, wrap up by just talking about another uh, recent body of work that culminated in 2014 um, called Not Going Shopping. I mean, I've been working with people who have experienced homelessness, as, you, as I've said, since about 2002, 2001, 2002. Alongside that, I've also worked with other groups of people, and I'm really interested in how, how this sort of ideas of participation and collaboration might sort of enable people who are overly spoken for to amplify their kind of concerns and the things that they want to say. But within that, I've always sort of been on the outside. And I had an invitation from an organization in Brighton to make a body of work with queer people. And I thought, oh, OK, this is interesting. So all of a sudden, I'm the kind of subject of study. I'm a gay man. I've never really thought of myself in that way. I've never really sort of focused in on myself as the sort of uh, subject, uh, the person who's sort of being othered, the person who's been overly spoken for. And it was a really, I thought it was a really interesting opportunity for me to begin to sort of think about issues to do with my own sort of queer identity, queerness, and uh, the people that I would meet. And to also then think about this idea of a methodology. How can I just sort of find another way to use photography? And so I, I, I put a call out through local organizations in Brighton to, um, if they were interested, to um, send an email. Um, and I would give them some information about where I would like to meet them. And uh, uh, 11 people responded. And I invited them to a workshop um, in the premises of one of the commissioning organizations called New Writing South. And I asked people to bring along three photographs that told the story of them. And, uh, and I did as well. And we sat in a circle. And I thought just this kind of discussion would both enable each other, to, enable us to tell stories about each other, but also to kind of give me some insight into the person's kind of thinking about photography. Here we have Sarah Magdalena Love showing us some images, um, and Kelly McBride showing some as well. And what was interesting is that people brought along photographs that uh, were, were so kind of particular and personal. I mean, photographs are incredible things. Um, and, uh, and, and so here on the left, you can see a picture of Ed wearing the red T-shirt. Ed brought along this picture of this sort of line drawing, this really interesting line drawing of an old man. And I was like, Ed, what's this? You know, why? And uh, Ed was like, when, when they were in the body of, uh, of a girl, when they were eight years old, they, they drew this picture of the old man that they were in their head. And uh, uh, now, uh, over the, sort of the years before I met Ed, Ed was able to undergo um, surgery and, and all the kind of other sort of um, transitions that he needed to make in order to be the trans man that he is. And I wanted to think about some ideas. I wanted to really think about how we could develop a conversation. Um, and I wanted to think about that conversation through four lenses, family and friends, politics and place, and language, or politics and representation and, uh, and language. And, and so there are various kind of discussion-based activities that we undertook. Um, and at the same time, we talked about how could we, how could we represent the process of working together? And uh, we decided to keep a polyvocal blog, so a blog that we'd all have equal kind of access rights to, and, and we would each kind of take it in turns to reflect on 
uh, whatever element it was of the work right from the very beginning to now. And you can still see that blog, and, and actually it continues to be, well, it continued to be updated till after the exhibition. Um, and here we are undertaking a, a bit of an activity to come up with the name Not Going Shopping, which comes from a, a, a queer rights uh, chant in the late 90s, we're here, we're queer, we're not going shopping, which is a really kind of, I think, a really interest, important kind of reclamation of the word queer. And here's the, the blog, notgoingshopping.blogspot.co.uk. And we kept uh, in touch through, so we had this sort of public facing blog and then we had this private um, space on Facebook through which we, I, I wanted to sort of find ways to extend the conversation and decision making process in between the face to face meetings. Um, and so that was a really important platform which still, uh, still goes and we communicate through this all the time. And uh, so here we have Kate uh, showing some photographs. I gave everyone digital cameras and asked them to take them away to photograph their experiences in between our weekly meetings. And then one day, uh, Fox, this isn't Fox, this is actually 10, but Fox came in with uh, a, a, a passport photograph made in a, a place, a, a junk shop in Brighton called Snoopers Paradise. And, uh, and I thought, wow, this is a really cool thing. And, but it kind of, more than that, it, it kind of got me thinking about this idea of the photo booth as a, 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 having ha sort of, has this sort of legacy of, of a particular kind of use of photography with anthropological purposes in the sort of late 19th century to document uh, the other kind of the other, uh, pe the people that were being discovered and studied in the colonies, but also people who were being kind of um, classified in the criminal justice system. And, and so the, the, the idea of, of the photo booth as a sort of identity production box was really interesting. But also I thought it was a kind of an interesting, I don't know, closet, I guess. So we went down to the photo booth every week and made um, portraits of ourselves. And at the same time, we decided to create our own uh, photo booth. So this is Luke uh, creating the uh, curtain. And, uh, and so I taught people how to use digital medium format camera equipment tethered to a laptop. And uh, we undertook a process of creating collaborative <laughs> portraits. Now, Not Going Shopping was created in the context of a, a, a bigger project called Queer in Brighton. And Queer in Brighton uh, was essentially an oral history recording project and an ephemera collection project. And so over 150 queer people who have a connection to Brighton and Hove were, were interviewed. And uh, various uh, sort of activities were held to invite people to donate or uh, borrow for reproduction purposes. Uh, ephemera related to the cultural heritage of queer people living in Brighton and Hove. And so there's all kinds of reproductions in here of kind of, uh, you know, uh, various sorts of newspaper clippings, uh, feminist theatre projects, photographs of people. And, and so people who were, who were recorded were sort of age 16 upwards, quite an, an older age. And, Myself and a, a, a Polish poet called Maria Jostrebska uh, edited a selection of excerpts from the uh, oral history recordings and the, the material and commissioned some essays um, by academics as well and, and, and edited this anthology, uh, which also includes some, some creative writing too. And um, so in preparation for that, uh, together, um, the Not Going Shopping crew edited a selection of photographs that they had made and together with the uh, collaborative portraits, this is Sarah Magdalena Love, we included the, uh, the collaborative portraits and their photographs in the anthology as well. So the idea being, uh, the reproduction's a little bit sort of stark here, but we've got a couple of pictures of, of the individual in the uh, photo booth, a kind of queering of the photo booth wall, and then a portrait outside in Brighton. Here we have Raphael Fox, Luke Raysmith. This is Matt Robinson. This is Kate. This is Ed, Ed Whelan. JB. Kelly McDonald. 
Harry Pygar. And this is me. And in celebration of uh, LGBT History Month in February 2014, we staged an exhibition of 30 outdoor poster sites in public spaces across Brighton and Hove. Uh, and this is Luke Ray Smith being interviewed by the ITV News. Now, in order to provide some kind of um, contextualization for these posters popping out of nowhere on the streets of Brighton and Hove, we created a, a newspaper. And we had 4,000 copies which were distributed freely across uh, cafes, bars, residential homes uh, in Brighton and Hove. Um, and the newspaper contains not only the uh, collaborative portraits, but excerpts from the, uh, the blog, excerpts from the private Facebook conversations, of course, with the participants' consent. Uh, and documentation of the process of us working together. And that's the cover of the Brighton edition of the newspaper. Um, more recently, the work was shown in, oh, and this is the book which I just showed you. Oh, you can have a look at that too. I've only got one copy to pass around, but you're welcome to do that. Um, Oh, there, there was a, a, an exhibition of this work in Bri uh, sorry, um, Bristol in 2015, uh, early 2015 on the streets of Bristol. And, uh, and then in Malmo in Sweden for a, a, a festival call, uh, that, uh, called the Malmo Photo Biennale, which took its um, theme that year, contemporary activism. And for, for the uh, Malmo edition, we, we created a new newspaper uh, with a different newly commissioned piece of writing in the back, um, but another kind of representation of process. There's a bunch of these here, which you're more than welcome to take away. I mean, hopefully I've got enough for everyone. I'm not sure, but do you want to pass them around? The, and the, the part of the, the sort of, I suppose, the, the, the newly commissioned piece of writing in, in that uh, new newspaper really served to to help deal with the sort of decontextualization of this work from Brighton to Malmo and from the, the very different sorts of trajectory of LGBT rights that un, 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 sort of unfurled in in Sweden as opposed to the UK. Uh, and so the, the newspapers were distributed freely across Copenhagen and Malmo. Uh, more recently, this work will be exhibited um, in a curated exhibition in January next year. Uh, curated by a, um, a photography curator called Christian Monaki, and uh, we're going to show uh, a, cl a collaborative portrait in the gallery space and do another uh, reprint of the, a London edition of the newspaper uh, with a newly commissioned piece of writing in that with a, um, a very interesting uh, historian who has a particular research interest in queer family and place. That concludes my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. I'm just going to uh, maybe ask a question or two, but really I'm, I'm interested to hear what people have to say uh, from the floor, so very quickly bring people in um, from the audience. I just wanted to really um, just... Something, when you were talking, Anthony, I was sort of going back in my mind to uh, Belfast and meeting you. And um, I remember that, you know, one of the things that interested you about us was that we had this archive. Yes. And we had this huge problem because we had an archive that people had contributed to at a different kind of moment in our life as an organization, as a community photography organization, but at a time when the community was actually really active and quite you know, terrifyingly so, and engage in a war. Yes. And they were um, politically active. And so these photographs sort of came from that moment. And there they were in our cupboards and um, in, in books and, and um, negative strips containing this really dynamic archive. We didn't know what to do with it, mainly because we changed. Times had changed and the politics had changed. And, and Northern Ireland and Belfast then was in the peace process. 
and everything had changed and this kind of heat had gone out of them and there they were and so uh, I think Karen Downey had thought oh Anthony has got a problem with archives he's thinking about that he might help us solve our problem <laughs> so he must come over here and we'll talk about the archive but actually what happened was we I think for me what the, what the problem that you solved for us and people like you was that we were a um, had been begun as a community photography organization at a time when the community was, as I say, active and, and violently so, and was wanting to represent itself in a kind of propagandist way, really. Um, but then we had survived, and we were now in a different time and in a sort of completely different political moment where the community was no longer this active thing it was actually a kind of an official designation this thing called the community or the communities and Belfast Exposed really was this community gallery that consciously chose to develop an exhibition an artistic program in order to oppose these dominant ideas which were saying you know you democratize the arts you empower people we actually wanted to create a space, a free space, um, that was, had a boundary around it. And we needed this free space where we could create something new. And so we built a gallery. And we built a gallery when everyone was saying, get rid of galleries. Galleries, that's so last century. <laughs> and we built a gallery and a, and a kind of very formal commissioning and, and exhibition program to create free space. And this is really what I'm coming to. This idea that in breaking out of the kind of constraints of official democratization and official empowerment and official kind of um, inclusion, we built this space and we said to artists, come to this space. You are in charge now. You are the authors. And it created a kind of free space where the artist became the author and the transaction between the artist and the subject of their study and interest, these people, became almost a private transaction that wasn't bound up and constrained with policy and with official kind of empowerment policy, but became a very fluid and free space for you to be in. So it, you liberated, or people like you in a sense, took the heat off us, because we could say, you know, this is the artist, and it's between the artist and the people who are um, he's working with or she, she's working with. So I think I see that in those portraits, those self-assisted, those assisted self-portraits in Belfast, this kind of vigor in people who, in a community photography situation, would often be portrayed as kind of victims or weak or a kind of supplicants in a way that the vigor and the the humanity just and, and I remember in the gallery there were great big portraits and they just dominated and, and stood out and what I want what I'm coming to really is a question and that is that um, at what point does the other constraint which is identity and in Belfast identity was one of the constraints that we had to break through to find the person who you work with, and that's a collaboration. In what sense is identity itself a constraint? So you say, you know, I'm working with people who are homeless, or I'm working with people who um, are, are queer in, in Brighton. How does that constrain and exclude people? What, you know, because you're really working with people. Absolutely. So, I, yeah. yeah. Is I, identity another cage ab or constraint? Absolutely, and I think that, um, that, that that's often a kind of starting point for a conversation with people, is mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about being called homeless? How do you mm -hmm. feel about being called a lesbian? How do you feel about being called a faggot? What does that mean for you when mm -hmm. people kind of um, call you names? Um, how does that kind of form your own ideas about your identity and what other people might perceive about your identity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's interesting to hear you say um, that the, the sort of, so I just want to sort of go off mm. on a side and, and address something that you said, because it kind of really struck me. Um, you said that the gallery space enabled the organization to sort of take the heat off the organization mm. a little. 
And um, I've been around a little while now, a little bit longer than I had at that point. And so I've worked with a number of different types of organizations who've kind of come to me with different sort of um, invitations, or I've gone to them with different kinds of proposals. And I've worked with people who have very differing types of agendas. Mm -hmm. And um, when I reflect on that period, and I, I, I mean this very wholeheartedly, one of the things that was really unique for me about working with Belfast Exposed was how protected the space around me as an artist to make work was. So there was, there was you, the kind of ad agendas that had to be kind of met to source funding didn't touch me in the way they have with mm -hmm. other organizations. Mm -hmm. and, and I now realize that that was a very particular skill that you and Karen had in a way to kind of enable artists to create work that was, mm -hmm. I don't want to use the word pure, but was, 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 was kind of, completely not instrumentalized in any sense of the word in mm -hmm. ways that I've experienced in other places. And I think, I just wanted to sort of say mm -hmm. that really. Um, but this idea of identity, God, you know what? It is about people at the end of the day. And, uh, and, and I'm just interested in getting to know people. And I'm mm -hmm. interested in addressing the fact that I'm a photographer, uh, I'm an artist. I have this particular desire to make images and, and talk about things mm -hmm. uh, in a public context. And if people want to be part of that, that's great. And if they don't, that's completely cool too. And they can still work with me and, and, and uh, use the tools I have in my bag. Um, but, and if people change their mind, that's okay too. So there was a, in the London Underground exhibition, uh, I showed you an image of Christina Alvarado. And uh, when it came to, to the exhibition making time and much like Belfast Exposed, uh, the work at, for residency, I had um, kind of um, examples printed up and talk, mm -hmm. took them to the people, to the participants, invited the participants to the underground platforms where the work was going to be shown, invited participants to the uh, gallery space in Belfast mm -hmm. Exposed and upstairs into mm -hmm. the office where we kind of were working on the, um, the selection to get feedback and, and conversation. And, and uh, so Christina was fully on board and uh, with, with this, this work being shown on, on um, Stratford tube station and the other one I think was Charing Cross too for her and uh, then the exhibition happened it was started rather and she one day went there and found it really confronting and came to me very upset and wanted her pictures taken down mm -hmm. and I was like god I thought I tried to do everything to show her what it would be like and she asked me to take it down so we had all of her pictures from the underground show taken mm -hmm. down and then a few weeks later, after it had been on the BBC News and, you know, kind of got a little bit of public attention and some of her sort of friends were excited, there was a bit of a buzz around it, she came back to me and said, can I, can I be back in the exhibition? I couldn't at that point because we didn't mm -hmm. have the resources. Mm -hmm. But it really kind of, I'm rambling a little bit in answer mm -hmm. to your question, but I think this idea of, of identity is, is, uh, is huge. But it's more than that. It's about how we, how we kind of categorize people. I mean, even using the word homeless is kind of weird. And one of the things I felt really uncomfortable about when we launched Residency, the book, yeah. was inviting participants. And I you know, kept in contact with participants mm. and invited them and told them, but what was it going to be like for them to see themselves in a book two years after the work had been yeah. shown? And Brian Horrocks at that time had moved on. He was no longer homeless and, uh, you know, was very stably kind of housed and employed, but came along and was so proud yeah. to be in the book. He was on his way to a fishing trip. He was, he was going on a fishing trip to Mayo, yes. and he called in at the gallery and for the book launch, and he's in the book as a homeless, <laughs> experiencing homelessness, and he wasn't anymore, but he was so okay about that, yeah. and I suppose that's the, that's the thing about the sort of official identity politics in a way, is that it really labels people, it's not so much people labeling themselves, although the internal people do, we all do, and sort of internalize it and identify ourselves as some category or other and that puts up this huge barrier and I suppose in a sense particularly in Belfast which is just at that time was all about official categories of identity yes and the, the the government agenda was to manage things and bring everyone together and create all of these neutral and shared spaces and all of this sort of stuff that for us to have a little space in a gallery that was free and was actually managed by artists and the public or whoever they were and however they wanted to come in and use it was like an incredible sort of free space that you had that was outside whatever they're doing in there it's nothing to do with us they're doing it and um it, it became then a sort of 
separate space that became absolutely free. So we guarded it, and you notice that we guarded it, because we were guarding our own freedom, really, um, because it was contained in that space. But I do remember the um, when it intruded, which was on the opening night of residency, when this was shown in Belfast, and we, as the institution, as the organisation, I remember I was absolutely delighted because we got the minister... Oh, I forgot for, about Yeah, this. we had the minister for um, the Department of Social Development, yes. the minister had actually agreed to come to open an exhibition. We couldn't, mm. I, I was so delighted because we tried for years to actually get some sort of recognition, official recognition. Yes. And um, Karen was all excited, yes. but a bit more worried than me because she sort of saw it was coming. And we told Anthony, the minister of um, you know, Department for Social Development is coming to open the exhibition. <laughs> Anthony just said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and of course it was a problem because what she wanted to do was to take this exhibition that they had spent months, obviously, and reshape it into, to talk about that the Department for Social Development was building houses and was addressing this problem and it was, you know, they had to deal with it and they were on the case and so on. She was actually really quite a nice woman. She was. Um, but it was that sort of that you sort of see it dramatized that way that officialdom just takes everything all the work all of the things that have gone on just appropriates it yes and then feeds it back um as as part of their sort of political yes. narrative and um it, you see how as, but when you're negotiating with institutions and organizations no matter how much you try to guard against it how easy it is to absolutely gosh it's so i'm so thrilled that you've reminded me of this oh, I still dream you know, about because it. it was a really big deal for me at the time because I felt such a sense of guardianship over the relationships that I had with participants and I I didn't know it was coming and I didn't know what it meant and mm. I didn't know who she was or what she stood for and I didn't quite know how to mediate that to participants yeah and um, yeah it was actually a really I mean I was frightened about working in Belfast I, I, when I first came to work in Belfast because I didn't I didn't know about the troubles. I didn't live. I'm not from the UK. Um, I didn't know what it meant to live in Belfast. I didn't know. I didn't. It was, it was so much to learn, and uh, it was through. I remember having so many conversations with you about the politics of Northern Ireland mm -hmm. and books that you lent mm -hmm. me, and I was mm -hmm. voraciously reading. And I was um, lodging with a, an artist called Rita Duffy, who was. Um, very much involved in community DIY, grassroots, community public mm -hmm. art projects. So I had this fantastic kind of induction with these very connected, bright people around me. Sort of, you know, but also then the participants. You know, yeah, the welcome place the was welcome great, place wasn't it? It was extraordinary because the, mm -hmm. I never, I don't know what religion people were. I have mm. no, I, I think I know about a couple, but mm. it was so not on the agenda. The Welcome Organization, the Welcome Center um, it, it is, I think it's funded by the Catholic Church, um, but th there's no sort of remit only for Catholics. You know, it, mm. it, there are all kinds of people in there. And yeah. this this idea of, of homelessness in Northern Ireland, I think there's like a double displacement, not only kind of um, without a home, but you're also possibly rejected or a community, uh, from your you? community. Yeah. And, um, and, and that, that was a, mm. particularly for young men at the time, I remember there were a lot of young men who were very uncared for and didn't quite know how to deal with the sort of shift in politics in Northern Ireland um, mm -hmm. in the sort of post-conflict mm. period.